suppose you'd have to say that Abraham and his wife were among the most significant people recorded in the Bible, but mostly, unfortunately, for the wrong reason. Yes, all mankind came from them, but they really only produced eight people to speak of to carry on the human race once the flood had gone and Noah's family had to start again. Adam had a significant life in that his wrong choice has been a curse to all mankind as a result. Sin entered humanity by one man, by Adam. And Noah played a huge part, being one of the scripture's very significant characters. You cannot trivialise the faithfulness and sacrifice that he displayed in saving animals, birds, and keeping the human race from extinction. Now, there are many more significant individuals taught about in the Bible, uh, in the narratives of the scriptures, but I believe the most significant life recorded, other than the life of Jesus Christ, is that of Abraham. No other person accepting Christ himself has had as huge an impact on the world than Abraham. Like untold millions, Abraham's life could easily have passed by without leaving a ripple or a record to mark his ever having existed. But Abraham has a name that is revered around the world and cherished as much as any normal man ever could be. More than any other, he is honoured with the title of father. He is frequently called Father Abraham, as we sang this morning. We will take a good look at the life of this one man in order to try and see why his life is so significant in world history. Abraham started life known as Abram, which meant exalted father. That's interesting because that is what he is actually remembered as. However, in time, his name was changed by God to Abraham, which meant father of many. This name change is important for us to know since in the earlier chapters of Genesis we see him referred to as Abram, but later as Abraham. So if you don't know there's a name change going on, it can be a little bit confusing. But we, we can know who's being spoken of when we realise that God has changed his name. Now before Abraham entered the picture, God had largely dealt with people collectively. We saw the wickedness of the earth dwellers, and God saw that wickedness and he judged them with a flood. At Babel, when a united populace strove to build a tower to the heavens, God restrained their activities with language divisions. Then God now shifts his focus to a relationship with a particular individual and a family line. God sees qualities of faith and devotion in a man living in Ur of the Chaldees and he calls him, even as an elderly man, into an amazing relationship with himself. In Genesis 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God called Abram out of a powerful and prosperous city, and what was probably a comfortable lifestyle. He was called from security to uncertainty and risk. I wonder, if you were Abram, what would you have done? Think about his circumstance, think about his situation. Would you just leave behind your country, your friends, your relatives, your home, and head out, not knowing even where you were going? We're told what Abram's choice was in verse 4 of Genesis 12. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, 
and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now what we need to realise when the call first came to um, uh, Abram from God, he was living in the city of Ur, mentioned elsewhere in Genesis. And after the call, we see Abram doing exactly what God instructed. He did set out on the journey as God instructed him. However, we see that Abram's father, Terah, accompanied him and his family group. Now, they made it about halfway to the land God was leading them to. You can see right at the top of the red line, about the middle of the map, you see Haran. And uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of the red line, you'll see her where Abram started his journey. And they made it about halfway. And then Terah held up progress by settling them down in Haran. We don't know why, but it actually, um, we do find that this is the town which bore his other son's name in Genesis 11, 27. We see that Haran was one of Terah's sons. Now for a time, the journey to the land of promise was put on hold. And in time, his father Terah died, and then Abram continued unhindered on his journey, accompanied by the rest of his family. Genesis 12, 1 says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your home and go to your country. So he left from Haran, as we read in Genesis 12. So the Lord came, called him, Abram responded, Terah went with him, Terah eventually died in Haran, and then Abram headed off again on the journey. Chapter 12, verse 4 tells us that he was 75 when he eventually departed Haran for Canaan. Now, after the calling of Abram, God interacted significantly a number of times with that Abram. After reaching Canaan and separating with Lot, God came to Abram in a vision in chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Now, Abram asked God for a sign, a proof of the reality of his promise. He had been promised essentially millions of offspring, yet was entirely childless at this point. Verse 2 says, But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my state is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. But God clarified that it would not be a worker in his household, it would not be a servant who would inherit Abram's estate, but it would be a son from his own body, a biological heir. Verse 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And it was Abram's total and confident trust in God to perform a mighty miracle of bringing him offspring in spite of the physical improbability of it, that brought salvation to Abram. Verse 6, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. We often think that righteousness in the Old Testament came through um, sacrifice and obedience and keeping the law, etc., etc., etc. But actually, in the Old Testament, the same as in the New, Salvation is by faith, and Abram uh, discovered that from himself personally, by faith alone, that he was actually saved. Now, God also vowed possession of Canaan to Abram in verse 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. And God then sealed this promise with a binding contract made in blood. You would have read this as you were going through. Uh, there was a, a young cow, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon, and the, the bigger animals were cut in half and laid out. And God walked between the people. 
leases, and that was a contract that was done in those days. It was basically saying the agreement we are making together, when normally both parties walked through the bodies of the dead animals, they were saying just as these dead animals cannot be uh, put back together and you cannot reverse what has been done to them, so we cannot reverse this contract. It's sealed in blood. Uh, it is permanent. When only God walked through the pieces, the contract depended only on God for fulfillment. The keeping of the promise did not rely on Abram at all. It was an unconditional covenant made by God. Not conditional on Abram, unconditional, because God never breaks his promise. It could never be broken. And this is the perfect picture of salvation for us. Our deliverance into heaven is totally dependent on God. It's as if he walked through uh, the blood by himself. And we just agreed to it. Um, but he is the one that keeps the promise of salvation and he will deliver us um, through the blood. Now, that's the faith of Abraham, but I just want to tell you about the fear of Abraham because twice in Abraham's life, that we know of, of at least, we see him displaying fear. He was an old man, he wasn't some superman. Uh, his wife Sarah was exceedingly beautiful, even at the age of 65. And a famine in Canaan brought Abram and his entourage to Egypt in, in uh, Genesis 12, uh, 10 through 20. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife, and then they'll kill me. I will let you live. Say you're my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was a very beautiful woman and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Interestingly, in chapter 20 of Genesis, we read of a similar event when Abraham was for a while in the territory of King Abimelech near Gaza. And the king took Sarah into his household, but was warned by God in a dream telling him about the deception. And Abraham gave the reason in verse 11 to Abimelech why he had done this. Uh, he said, they will kill me because of my wife. And that's why he allowed this to happen. Abimelech showed great character at this point. In fact, greater character than Abram. But God had made a binding promise to Abram. <clears throat> God would keep it in, in spite of the fact that Abram is really his failing at this point. Even our failures cannot stop God from fulfilling his promises. When he left Abimelech, Abram was increased in wealth. Then Abimelech brought sheep and cattle and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham and he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, My land is before you, live wherever you like. To Sarah he said, I'm giving your brother a thousand shekels of silver. This is to cover the offence against you before all who are with you. You are completely vindicated. Uh, Abraham was in fact half-brother to Sarah and that's why he was telling the truth, she is my sister. But he wasn't telling the truth by hiding the fact that they were married. Abram was a man like us. He wasn't a superman. He had his fears. He had his feet of clay, as you and I do. And although Abraham was subjected to times of fear, we must take note also of the courage of Abraham. You see, when the pastures for grazing livestock became insufficient for Abram's nephew Lot and his own flocks and herds, the two separated on friendly terms. Abram even generously let his nephew choose the area he wanted to settle in. 
Lot lived in the plains where Sodom and Gomorrah were, and it was very fertile, lush, grazing pasture for Lot's flocks and herds. One day, some rival kings of those whose territory Lot was living in swept down and overthrew the local kings. They withdrew, taking plunder and captives with them. We're going to pick it up in chapter 14, verse 12. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anna, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. Now that's not a bad effort. 318 fighting men against the armies of four kings, however large that was. But you can already see how Abram's tribe, as it were, his, his entourage, his, has grown. Abram was a brave man, and I believe his courage was based on his reliance on God to fulfill his promises. Um, but Abram pursued after Lot. Lot was not necessarily included in Abram's little package of of covenant with God, and so we see him as a very courageous man to go and do this uh, and to rescue his nephew. We see the faith of Abraham. You know, one thing that marks Abraham out above all others is his faith. We saw that at the start with his call. He trusted God, he believed God, and he followed the call. That was faith put into action. Let's look at that faith a little bit. It was his inclination towards God, his desire to please God, that singled him out in the beginning. When God noticed Abram and he called this man, he drew him into a relationship with himself. When God looked throughout the earth for a faithful man, he found Abram. He called Abram to himself. And when God promised an old man who had a wife past childbearing years that he would father a great nation more numerous than the stars in the heavens, Abram didn't go, yeah, right God, like that's ever going to happen. That wasn't his attitude at all. He believed God completely. Now, you have to put yourself in his situation. Imagine yourself at his age, 75. Some of you have, have been there. I recognize that. But at 75, leaving to inherit a land, to father children, and to establish a nation. And God has said, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make your name great. And there are going to be multitudes that come from you. Your family will be extended throughout the earth. It's going to be incredible. He believed God completely. He trusted God's word to be as good as done, no matter how many obstacles may have stood in the way of their fulfillment. We just in the New Testament, it testifies concerning Abram's faith in Romans 4, verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, this is when um, Isaac was conceived, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness, which is a quote from the Old Testament. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. See, after the blood covenant God made in Genesis 15, God appeared to Abraham in his 99th year and promised, or actually confirmed, repeated his promise that he would give the son by Sarah. Genesis 17, um, we read in our reading, it says, uh, God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you, you will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful, I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you for generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. As a mark of uniqueness to the world, that Abram's line um, were the people of God, a physical distinguishing mark was to be upon their bodies. God instructed the males all be circumcised, uh, which is the surgical removal of the male foreskin. Now this was not something others would think of doing. It's not something people would choose to do for themselves, as this is a great idea. So it would be unique to the family of Abraham, a physical distinguishing um, trait that only God's people would be reflecting. Uh, verse 23 of 17, Genesis 17, On that very day Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money every man in his household and circumcised them as God told him. And this was an incredible step of obedience based on Abram's love and trust toward the God who made him an unbreakable covenant, uh, made an unbreakable covenant with him. Abram's faith had practical outworkings in his life, even doing the tough things that God asked him to do. The legacy of Abraham, what's he left for us? Well, Abraham was a man whose life changed the world. A nation and a country was founded upon him and exists today as Israel. God helps all those who helps Israel and he opposes all those who attack Israel. You just have to watch the news to see the way that transpires. Abraham's nation is described by God as the apple of his eye, his most highly prized possession. Whatever you do, don't mess with Israel. Don't stick your finger in God's eye. But greater than this is Abraham's spiritual legacy. As I said earlier on, he is the father of true faith. He showed us how to completely trust God. In believing God, he was rewarded with salvation. Now, our salvation is not based on a promise of our own son, as Abraham's was, he was promised and he believed. And that was his justification. Our salvation is based on believing the promise of God concerning his own son. When we believe God that he removes every sin and gives us eternal life through Jesus, we are justified forever. Romans 4 tells us, We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised? Or before? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Verse 16 uh, of Romans 4 says, To those who are of the faith of Abraham, he is the father of us all. Not only Romans, but elsewhere tells how Abraham's faith led the way for Christians to follow. Galatians 3 verse 6 says, Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham, quote, all nations will be blessed through you, end quote. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And that's Galatians 3, 6 to 9. We are not physical children of Abraham, or that would make us Jews, except for David, he can claim that one. But we are his spiritual descendants. Romans 9, 7 says, Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated, quote, At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son, end quote. The extreme example of the extent to which Abraham believed God was seen in his willingness once the promised son was born, uh, and while Isaac was a young man, Abram was willing to slay his son at God's instruction. Now that's a sermon on its own. But Abram did all that God asked, and God gave Isaac back to him alive. And because of his obedience, Abram was richly blessed by God. Now, I wonder how many of us would believe God, believe with the actions, believe God the way Abram did. Abram was a man who believed God. God spoke and Abram took him at his word. Because of this, he led the way for us all to follow in trusting God. Abram was a man of faith. Abram is the father of the faithful, or should I say the faith filled. He was not perfect. He faltered at times through natural fear, some impatience and other human frailties, but he never backed down on believing God, that God would do all that he had promised. And we need to aspire to follow his example. The result of Abraham's devotion was a place of deep relationship with God that we too can aspire to. James 2 verse 23 says this, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this story of Abraham. What an amazing life. What an amazing faith. May we be inspired and encouraged by his life. We know we're living in an entirely different uh, century, uh, millennium, with very different circumstances, very different world. But we have the same God. And you are as faithful and true to your promise today as when you spoke to Abram. Lord, would we learn to lean upon you in trust? Uh, step out in faith, in trust, if you ask us to, as you ask Abram. Would you help us to risk? And risk is never easy. It's often not cheap. But Father, would you create in us the kind of trust that would say, yes, I'll do it all. And we just go ahead and do it. Even if it means that we might lose something very dear to us. Father, we just pray that we would have that kind of strength of character, strength of, of faith, that our hearts would be confirmed in the faith that we first received when we trusted Christ as our Saviour. Lord, may that faith grow. May we have complete confidence in the saving power of our Lord to rescue us completely from hell and to assure us 100% that we are going to heaven because it's not up to us. It's